Well, welcome to Washington Walks Webinar Wednesdays for June 3. This is our most Zoom squares we've had. Mm -hmm. And that's as it should be because <clears throat> we, need, we need five women, well, we need four women and a host to do justice to the woman we're gonna be talking about and finding out about today. And that is Marion Hooper. Clover Adams. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome a non-Washingtonian, Natalie Dykstra. <clears throat> She's the author of the 2012 biography, Clover Adams, A Gilded and Heartbreaking Life. And her biography figures prominently into how kind of two walking tours end up germinating <clears throat> a piece of theater art in Washington, D.C. A wonderful convergence of hometown history, um, small business enterprise, local theater, and then this wonderful work of literature that kind of brings it together, not to mention the art produced by the person we're going to be talking about, mm -hmm. Clover Adams. Um, I'm also happy to have back Lauren Rocklin, who's joining us from Alexandria. She's one of the playwrights of the play Clover that was produced in 2017 right here in downtown Washington. She co-wrote the play Clover with Ty Hallmark who is a theater artist here in DC, founder of a local theater company called Ally Theater. You can catch them out of Joe's Movement Emporium in Mount Rainier. And Ty, for a while, was a Washington Walks tour guide. Then Victoria Reinsell, who is Washington Walks guide and our invaluable admin person, she's here today because we're gonna to get to hear an excerpt from the play, Clover, toward the end of our session. But I wanna start with, I'm gonna stop the share of the welcome slide, and I'm gonna share this slide. And this is a quote, whoops, Hold on, there, can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, this is a quote, Natalie, when I was going back over your book mm. the past few days, that I saw, it's one of the first, it's the first page you come to as you start the book, and it's one of two quotes that are on a page. One is a quote of Clover Adams, and the other is this quote, which I wanted to start with, or just take a moment because I think this quote really speaks to what we are as a country and certainly as a nation's capital are struggling with today. All forms of decay knock at our gates and summon us to go out into their wilderness. And yet every ideal we dream of is realized in the same life of which these things are part. So that is, uh, intellectual um, psychologist William James mm -hmm. to Ellen Hooper, oldest niece of Clover. And I think that it's all part of life. It's mm -hmm. the decay in the wilderness and our ideals all together. Um, the quote, just so folks will know, that Clover is um, quoted on the same page is, the moral is to make all one can out of life and live up to one's finger's ends. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's start with this image, Natalie. For Washingtonians and people in the DC metro area, for a lot of Americans, this is the image, this is the memorial that's given them maybe their introduction to mm -hmm. Clover Adams. This is her gravesite and the gravesite of her husband in Rock Creek Cemetery, right here in Washington, DC, known as the, officially as the Adams Memorial, often called Grief. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, since we're calling this Encountering Clover, mm. 
How did you first encounter Clover Adams? Well, it was really through this statue. It's such a mysterious figure, isn't it? And, you know, when Henry um, was designing the memorial, he was very clear he did not want that grave to be marked. So there's no signage, there's no dates of their birth and death dates. He wanted people to come around those that grove of trees and have an experience of art and, and then take from it what they made of it. And in 1918, after his death, just after he died, um, he was kind of in the talk, people were talking about him in Washington because he was a longtime Washingtonian, obviously. And um, Eleanor Roosevelt um, was um, a young, married to FDR, young mother of five, and she had just found out about FDR's um, affair with Lucy Mercer. And she used to come in 1918 um, to sit in front of the Clover's grave every Tuesday morning. If you looked at her um, weekly, um, sort of her day book, it was Tuesday mornings. Sometimes she'd bring friends, sometimes she would just come out by herself and she would sit and look at that statue. And I read a, a wonderful, uh, the first um, volume of Blanche Wise and Cook's mm -hmm. volume, um, wonderful biography of Eleanor Roosevelt. And in an end note, she talks about Clover Adams and a little bit about who she was and that she was a photographer. Right. So, I, so there was just a click, click, click. I, I, I would myself was finishing up a dissertation looking back to 19th century women to understand their stories, in part probably to understand my own, right, as a young, younger person. Mm -hmm. and I got very fascinated by Eleanor Roosevelt reaching back 50 years, having met Henry Adams and knowing the gossip in town that he had had an affair with, um, that Henry Adams had had an affair. And so here she is trying to sort out what am I going to do with FDR and, and, and wanting to make a different choice. And somehow that combination of me looking back in history, Eleanor Roosevelt looking back in history, I just thought, who is this Clover Adams and how come I don't know her? Well, and one reason- In, women, in women's history, I was, had taken all these women's history courses in, in grad school. So who was she? Well, in this photograph right here, I decided I was gonna, you know, this is the one photograph that exists yes. where we can see her face. This is kind of. a photograph. She's far away from us. Yes. I thought I would pick one that was kind of small scale to kind of be emblematic of how um, it's been hard to come to know her. You, I think, mentioned photographs and in the biography you wrote, her work as a photographer really seems like it was a point of entry for you. Totally. To understand her. Absolutely. So, I, so the next time I was in Boston, I was on a research trip and I knew that her photographs were held at the Massachusetts Historical Society. So I asked to see them, not thinking that I could, and they brought out the albums. And I, I'll never forget, because you don't forget these moments, I opened those albums and saw images that both were so familiar in a certain way, because she had, um, was inspired by painting in her, the composition of her photographs, and also completely unfamiliar. So they were both, I, they, I seem to sort of recognize them and not recognize them at the same time. Well, they're and That just piqued my curiosity. And yeah. I thought, how, who is this? And Kodak doesn't happen until 1888, and she's taking photographs in 1883. So how did she make those photographs? And and, and then I was very interested, did they express something, mm. right? Were right. they, could photographs be eloquent about someone's life like letters are eloquent? Mm -hmm. That was kind of the original question. So this is the fruit of your inspiration, um, this biography that comes out in 2012. And I will just add right now, I was not in the, I had nothing to do with the writing of this book or the uh, play that Ty and Laura wrote, but I'm gonna take credit 
that I saw a review of this book in the New Yorker. And I looked at it and I went, Natalie Dykstra? Wait, <laughs> is that my Natalie Dykstra? It was, because we went to college together. <laughs> but then I'm all excited because Washington Walks is doing this walking tour called The Most Haunted Houses about sites in Lafayette Park, including the site where the Hay Adams house once stood and including stories about Henry and Clover Adams and her death and possible hauntings. So then I broadcast this news of this new biography to the tour guides and that tie was one of them. So my little moment for this journey was, was that moment. But Natalie, for people who are listening and may not know who Clover Adams was beyond maybe there's this famous gravesite to her in Rock Creek Cemetery. What's sort of the kind of encapsulated biography of her? So she was born in 19, 1843, um, the youngest daughter of um, a Boston Brahmin family. Her mother, Ellen Hooper, um, Ellen Sturgis Hooper, was a very gifted poet and friend of Ralph Waldo Emerson and published in The Dial, which was a journal of the transcendentalists in the mid 19th century. Um, and she was a, a really remarkable woman and tragically died of tuberculosis when Clover was five. And that early loss, I started to understand as a, a profoundly important um, part of her story that hadn't really been talked about much before. Um, and she had a very, um, good education. She went to the Agassiz School, um, as did a lot of girls in, in Boston. And, um, and then she, um, she had a very interesting life during the Civil War. Her, the, the Civil War chapter was an interesting one to write. And, and then she lived with her widowed father who never remarried. And she, was, uh, she remained unmarried until she was 28, which was quite late for a woman to marry. And she met Henry Adams and um, they married in 1872 and lived in Boston for a time. There he is, <laughs> her yeah, photograph so of him. The, this, I wanted to use, the, this is an image of the photo albums from the Massachusetts Historical Society that you got to look at. These yes, are the, these are the ones. There yeah. they are. He, there he yeah. is in his white coat. This, this is one of her photographs. That's, yes, absolutely. Uh, on the North Shore in their home in Beverly Farms. I was actually, I was able to stand in that very room. Um, in any case, and then they moved to Washington in um, 18, late 1870s and they, their salon uh, near Lafayette Square was the place to be. Um, everybody came and um, for their lunches and dinners and parties and, and they knew everybody. Um, and it's in part because Henry Adams was the grandson and great grandson of presidents. It was also because she was a very interesting host. She was known for her wit. She really was extraordinarily funny. Sharp, could be very sharp. He was also a good listener. So all the generals and diplomats, they loved to say that word because she would laugh at their story. And, um, you know, she was, um, she was really very sharp. I always felt like Henry James understood her quite well. Um, I, I, I think I have a line in the book where I say they were both portraitists, right? They were both, yes. you know, yep. yeah, yeah. And, um, and, I, and he really appreciated her wit. I, I sort of wish I, I included more of her wit. I, there, it, it's there in the book, but there's so much more in the letters. Um, so, and then she took up photography in 1883 and, um, and really was right from the start. That's a very early one. That's the first one that she records in the day book that I found at the Mass Historical Society. Um, and that was crucial to sort of untangling what was happening with her photographic practice because I had her notes, um, which were fascinating to read. And, um, and then, um, um, she really photographed a lot that first summer and through the next year. And then she was very close to her father, Dr. Robert Hooper. He died in early um, 1885 and she fell into a terrible depression, terrible darkness. Um, they had in the 19th century a phrase for it being pulled down. He was pulled down. They, they, 
friends would say in letters, she'd been pulled down. And that's such a vivid image, mm -hmm. I think, that so captures um, that, that kind of sadness. And um, by December of uh, 1885, December 6, when he had gone out to the dentist, he had terrible teeth. And he was always going to the dentist during these years. And he went off to the dentist for an emergency appointment on a Sunday morning. And he came back and found her dead in front of the fireplace. And she had um, ingested the potassium cyanide that she used to develop her photographs. She was 42 years old. There's a scene after that where he sits. Neighbors remembered him seeing him in their third floor of their win the second floor of their house on um, where the Hay Adams Hotel is now sort of sitting with her body, waiting for um, the next morning for her family to arrive. Yeah. It's extraordinary, yeah. And it really broke him in a profound way. He never really was the same in a certain way. Um, he's a complex figure. Um, I think he felt terrible guilt. I think he felt anger. I think he felt ashamed. It, you know, suicide is such a, has such a pall, mm -hmm. and it obligates the survivors to try to understand it, and yet it's very hard to understand it. So it seemed like the photographs might give an opportunity to hear what she was trying to say and what she couldn't say in her letters. Mm -hmm. Well, so I'm going to show this next photograph then. And this is a photograph that um, Laura and Ty, but Laura especially said was important to them as they embarked on the journey to create a play together. Um, Ty and Laura, I just learned yesterday, I knew of course that Ty was doing this Washington Walks tour where she was talking about Clover Adams and <laughs> that, um, that just this encounter she had with this person um, stayed with her. What I didn't know is what Laura was doing at the same time. Laura, you were doing a walking tour as well. I was. I was working with a group here in Washington called Historic Strolls. Um, and they actually had us actors playing different characters as they did the tour around Lafayette Square Park. And one of the characters I was playing was Clover Adams. <laughs> it's um, they had this very brief monologue um, which included a beautiful snippet of poetry from her mother, Ellen, actually. Mm -hmm. And I was just so curious. I wanted to learn more about this woman that I had this sort of brief snapshot of. So Ty and Laura, you knew each other? You, how did you both realize you were interested and you had encountered Clover Adams? Um, we were driving up to Ellicott City, Maryland, I think in 2012. Uh, we both knew that we were walking tour guides. And so we were having a conversation, I think about some, and we both knew we were doing tours in Lafayette Square. That's where that started. And we were having a conversation about some of the people we told stories about. And we both realized we had um, a very keen mutual interest in Clover Adams. And we just got to talking about her story and realizing, you know, just how much of it we didn't know or had been told. Um, I, I, Natalie touched on, you know, Henry's grief. Uh, one result of that was that um, she said, you know, he didn't put the names on the gravesite. He also didn't mention her in his autobiography. Um, right. And he just, he never really spoke of her. So in a way, um, she was, her story was erased. Mm -hmm. And we thought that through her photographs and her letters as well, maybe we could try and untangle and tell some of her story through this theatrical convention that we both, you know, also had in common. Tell us about this photograph, how it struck you when you first saw it. I mean, this one for me, I think, Ty and I also spoke a lot about Clover resonating with us as women artists trying to live and work in Washington and under that pressure. And this image is always striking to me because there's this small tree that's flourishing, but it's there amidst the rocks. 
and you can't really see anything in the sky behind it. It's just this lone, strong symbol. And to me, that really epitomized Clover. And I, you know, Natalie was talking about seeing the photo albums for the first time. And the first time I got to see them at MHS, they brought them out and they opened it to the page. <laughs> tree opposite the portrait of Henry. And I just sort of thought, I mean, to me, that said either, you know, in some ways, Henry is this very strong lone figure, but also that was the image that Clover put of herself opposite the image of Henry. Yeah. And I thought that that idea was really stunning. And I had this picture sort of by me on my desk most of the time as we were writing the play. And can I say one thing about the pairing? She does it not once, but twice, right? So it happens that she follows a port Henry portrait with this lone tree. So oh you my God. Think if it's, you know, once is maybe a coincidence or an act, but twice is intentional, <laughs> right? Then you have really intent. And I looked through hundreds of other photograph albums of the time period just to see if I could find, if it was, and I never found, if it was a woman photographer, she had her husband and herself, a, a portrait of herself. And the same morning she took that photograph of Henry in the white jacket, she took a photograph of herself, but she says in her notebook, good photo, um, good, for, good photo, but horrible. In other words, she didn't like the way she looked in the mm. photograph. Yeah. So she removes her, the kind of visual representation of herself. Well, here is another one. <clears throat> I love this one. Um, their neighbors in Lafayette Park were John and Clara Hay, and they end up building the adjoining homes that wrapped around 16th and H streets known as the Hay Adams house. So these are the children of John and Clara Hay that she photographed. And this could be today. This could be children from the 1940s in America or in Europe. This is such a contemporary looking photograph. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, here is one. I love this one too, and I bet, I bet Ty and Laura do. Uh, again, this Smith's Point, which is a point of um, land outside of Boston, I'm assuming, right, Natalie? Yeah, North Shore, yeah. Yeah, so here are these three women, and two of them have their backs to us, and the one facing doesn't even look into the camera. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's I, I just love it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Well, Ty and Laura, what the, what, did the photographs end up playing a role in the play that you wrote? Very much so. Um, another, another photograph, and I think you're going to show it later, that was an entry point for me. Um, when we're talking about her being erased from history and being invisible, there's a self-portrait of her in profile where she's wearing a bonnet hat, and the hat is covering her face. Yes. Herself. So that you're showing the picture now, that it's actually inspired um, the promotional uh, this work that we did. Yes. Yeah. So um, this is the image that was for the play mm -hmm. that you with Adams Moore in the background. And if you knew any of her photographs, you knew clearly it was inspired by this. Yes. And we should also mention that the promotional photography and the production of photography, we worked with a uh, a local uh, DC area photographer, Teresa Castrocani. Um, and she also, during our production, had um, in our gallery, in our lobby, she did um, an exhibit of her photographs inspired by Clover's photographs. So that was something really special that we could use Clover's story to also amplify the work of another contemporary um, female DC photographer. Now, I remember you saying, I think it was Ty said this yesterday when we were talking, um, here is a husband who there were rumors about perhaps an affair with another Lafayette Park neighbor, doesn't write about her, the 13-year marriage they had in his very still in print, well-known autobiography, The Education of Henry Adams. But you both felt strongly that this man should not be characterized as the villain. Exactly. Um, like Natalie said, he was a very complex uh, man. Um, and, and Clover was a very complex woman. They had a complex marriage. Um, and 
um, we wanted to really show and talk about the effects of grief, not just on Clover and her life, the way she grieved for her mother, the way she grieved for her father, but also the, what the effects of Henry's grief did to Clover's story. So yes, it was very important for us to not paint him as a villain, but also as a, a nuanced human with flaws. Mm -hmm. but and still it's one thing about the absence of her in the education, so he doesn't, he, he takes out 20 years of his life. <laughs> like there, it's it, like, he can't even get close to their marriage. He has to sort of, he brackets that away in silence. But it, it, it's also that he's writing in such an ironic voice yeah. in the education. And Andrew Del Banco makes a really good argument, I think, that to write ironically about Clover, just he wasn't going to do that. He, he just wasn't going to do that. And he is also the son of famous, of fame, right? So, so he just, I think that silence was protective of himself, but also of her in a certain way. And I had a woman at one of my talks raise her hand and said, and he gave her the best thing he could, which was St. Saint Gaudens. Yeah. Uh, Right? right. Her, his tribute to her was to hi hi hire the very best sculptor in America to mark her grave. And given how much she cherished art and how much she was emerging as her own artist, that, that was a kind of nonverbal acknowledgement. Right? So that was an interesting comment from, from, from an audience member, I thought. Um, and I think what's really moving, actually, in the education of Henry Adams is that, isn't this right, Natalie? When he picks up his life story again. Yes. He's sitting by the memorial. Yes. Yeah. That's when he starts to write about his life again. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, here is an image <laughs> from the production. And I want you both to tell folks, I hope some people who are participating got to see the show in 2017. Where did you end up performing it? You want to take that, Laura? <laughs> um, well, we wanted to find a venue that would actually be close to Clover's old stomping grounds. We figured we're doing the show in DC. We're telling the story about this woman who was so connected to the life in the city. Um, and we found this marvelous little space called Chaos on F. Um, and we loved it in that it was a very small sort of black box space slash art gallery. But it allowed us in some ways to sort of make audience members feel like they were being invited into our parlor. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I, I loved hearing responses because there were times that Henry and I were arguing over audience members. Um, and, you know, they were very much in the middle of this, this story. And I think mm -hmm. it, it was a wonderful way to be able to immerse them. Clearly, you brought her role as a photographer into the show. Yes. We did. Um, we even had the um, Anne Palmer, who was the friend, who was her friend that introduced her to photography by taking her up to New York to a photographic, a photography exhibit. Uh, we even had her as a character in the play and sort of showed that how that interest started. It was a very big part of the play. We even, and you can see in this picture that's showing now of uh, Laura, and that's uh, Nick DePinto, who played Henry Adams. Um, you can kind of see in the background there that there are pictures all over the set. Um, we, our set designer, um, took copies of her pictures and put them up all over the set. Yeah, that and was nice. Mm -hmm. And here you can see again that you created a parlor room that we, the audience, sat in kind of around and watched this life unfold. Mm -hmm. And here's the one. This is the Ann Palmer character, right? Well, actually, it's, it's the actor that played Ann Palmer, but in this scene, she's playing Clara Hay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, that's Alani Kravitz. And then um, behind her is Ben Lauer, who played John Hay. Mm -hmm. They were incredible. They were like the comic relief of the show. <laughs> now, um, I never give up hope on artistic inspiration. And certainly in this day of streaming service where content for all these streaming services is needed. Laura's original idea to write a mini series about <laughs> Clover Adams. I want it. I want the 13 part. 
that starts with her life in Boston. We want Natalie's book, essentially, <laughs> that yeah. goes all the way <clears throat> through her life. So, Laura, do not throw away that material. Hang on to it. But you had to make a choice about you're going to telescope into one part of her life. And what, what part did you choose? We decided to focus on their life in Washington because we were producing it here. But there was an original script that was very unwieldy that did begin in Boston with her at the Agassiz School and there were scenes with Ellen Emerson and with Dr. Hooper. Um, and I think I have it somewhere. But we did decide that for the purposes of a play, um, especially when they were producing in Washington, we wanted it to be about her life here. Yeah, one of the, some of the feedback we got when the play was in development was, you need to get them to DC fast. I think it was like 30 pages or something. So now here she is. <clears throat> Who is she sitting with at this table? So this is um, the actor is Tamika Chavis, and she is playing the role of Lizzie Cameron, Elizabeth Cameron, who, as Natalie said, was their neighbor um, in DC. And um, there were rumors that. Uh, Lizzie Cameron had an affair with Henry, and so we wanted to address that as part of the show. We thought it was an important part um, of their marriage to look at. Yeah, and um, I know you had uh, Natalie came to see the show. Yeah. How, did that, how did that come about, Natalie, that you found out, oh my goodness, someone's doing a theater piece about Clover Adams? Oh, well, they reached out to me and um so uh and then and they kept me sort of up to date about when the show would open and um i was incredibly nervous i can't tell you how my heart was in, just in my th it was just such a you you it took me 10 years to write this book and i i um you know she was so in my imagination for so long and then it's somehow it's external to you and there she is. And, and Laura did such a great job. I mean, she just so inhabited her, something about her energy, I thought just totally captured it. It was a very moving experience. It was very humbling and moving. And, and I just found it, um, I was just so glad that her story had inspired a younger generation. You know, this, this is how she, can be remembered or this is how she can move through time right is that, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, in a, and and from book to play right it's a different art form it's a different and I, I just found it incredibly moving so when you came I was I got to go to the performance where you also attended so you had <clears throat> a, a talk back time with the audience Ty and Laura did you do that more than once I think we did um, when Natalie came, we also had her do a book signing, which was very nice. Oh, yeah. um, but we had uh, quite a few uh, talkbacks. We had some with just Laura and myself. I think we did one with you, Carolyn. Um, we talked about all kinds of issues that the play brought up. I mean, we were able to have conversations, not just about women artists living in DC and the unique challenges that I think we face and opportunities that we get from living here. Um, but we were also really able to talk about um, mental illness and depression specifically and anxiety, um, which is another sort of uh, entry point for me personally into Clover's life. Um, and just how hard it was, if not impossible, for both Clover and Henry to really address that, you know, that that was going on in her life um, because they just didn't have the language for it then and they didn't have the resources um, that we do now. So there was real right. social, there was social shame about it, right? So mm -hmm. there was this thought that it, it showed a weakness, uh, a weakness of character, a weakness of, um, there was just a lot of social shame. She really had a fear of McLean's, uh, which is a um, hospital, um, psychiatric hospital outside of Boston. Um, and of there's an early letter where she says, you do not want to end up there. So she, she really, there was, um, they just didn't understand it like we understand it now. And there's still shows, so there's still a lot of shame kind of oh, yeah. with mental illness, so. Yeah, and you all in the show, I mean, we'll show this, this image too. You um, incorporated the memorial as a silent character, but in the context of the show, I remember 
her because she seems more of a, the memorial is um, more gender neutral, but she, this was a she, it seemed like in the show, but she also seemed to represent for me as an audience member, <coughs> Clover's fear, Clover's anguish, um, and also Clover's strength, interestingly. Mm -hmm. yes. I love that you had, you, you had a figure. That was, uh, that's what, theater can do for you. That's theatrical convention right there. Uh, we really wanted something um, to represent um, Clover's grief. Mm -hmm. That was brilliant of you. That was so stunning to make that an actual character because one of the, one of the sort of themes I wanted to develop in the book was this, that she had been haunted, right? That she had, that there was all through her life there were were these hauntings or that she felt like a ghost i think i have a line where she feels like a um like a ghost and then to bring to use that as a, i thought that communicated it so beautifully mm -hmm. this is megan um Kazaran, who is uh, an amazing physical actor um she's in new york now but she did a lot of work with synetic theater here mm. in Washington before she moved well you all um, have brought for us an excerpt from the play. Let's hear that. And um, Ty, you did not perform in the show. No. You wrote the show. Yes. I, I like to say that um, I worked really hard on the structure and the, and the story. And then um, Clover, uh, Clover <laughs> Laura, Laura came in with just this brilliant dialogue. Um, so that's kind of how our partnership worked i would do the outline and be like okay i think here's this scene and this needs to happen can you give them words <laughs> <laughs> and then laura also played clover yes amazing so what's, what's the scene we're going to hear <clears throat> so we're going to read the first two pages of um the script and it was important to me that we start that the beginning of the play starts at the end um which is when um at clover's death um, and we have laura of course going to read over and Victoria is going to read the part of Clover's sister, Ellen. And I'm going to read stage directions. At rise. In the dark, the sound of a flashbulb pop from a camera. Henry Adams pounding on a door, yelling for Clover, asking her to please unlock the door. Slowly, like film developing in a lab, the lights come up and the picture becomes clearer. A woman, Marion Clover Hooper Adams, lies flat on the floor, an empty vial next to her. In the room, a writing desk strewn with papers, a camera circa 1880, a chair, a rug, light from a fireplace, photographs. Henry finally breaks down the door. Upon finding Clover's body and discovering she has died, he collapses sobbing into a chair. As Henry cries, Clover rises, looks to the spot where her body just lay, looks to Henry, but doesn't go to him. Instead, moves downstage, her dark room becomes lit. As Clover examines the photographs developing in their trays, she turns to the audience curiously. I spent much of my adult life observing the world around me through my camera but there was one object I could not step back and see through that lens, myself. I spent hours painstakingly posing my family, friends and acquaintance amidst scenes that would help tell the stories of their lives and accomplishments. My own life was not one I wished to examine that closely. Clover removes one of the photographs from a dark rim tray. It is the picture of her alone a hat shielding her face. She attaches it to a line for drying. As she does this, the shadow of grief appears on the wall behind her. Solitary Clover, without mother, without father, without children, was hardly an image I wish to preserve for posterity. However, now that I am removed from the restraints and expectations of life, I feel a curiosity creeping up on me to look back over the story that led to this moment. 
With a lighter step, as the years fall away from her, the lights lift become more cheerful. Clover moves forward to meet her sister, Ellen, who comes sweeping in carrying a necklace. She quickly turns Clover around and puts the necklace on her. They turn out to the audience as though looking at the necklace in a mirror. Oh, Nellie, is this really necessary? Yes. Clover, you are going to a dinner party, not one of your industrial school committee meetings. I am not accustomed to being frosted like a cake. Clover, you are my sister and I love you, but you are on the wrong side of 25. I have heard the word spinster connected with your name in Boston gossip. It can't do you any harm to attract the attention of gentlemen for something other than spouting unexpected Latin quotations. Unexpected, perhaps, but always pertinent. Pish posh. Greek quotations will not get you a husband. I don't know that the business of my life is to get a husband. My reform work is merely a distraction from your loneliness. You have an affectionate soul, Clovey, but ever since Mama died, you have kept yourself too busy. You're always busy. Busy with your volunteer committees, busy looking after Papa, busy looking after me and Ned. Well, Ned and I are both married and Papa is perfectly happy. It's time you focused on Clover. Nell, when I was younger, I spent years attending dances and dinners and outings to the theater. I am weary of that mild drizzle of gaiety. Well, there should be more to life than looking fetching while elegantly posed on a drawing room settee. You are impossible. I am right. Well, who is this new Harvard professor that your husband has invited us all to meet this evening? I've not met him yet myself, but he is the professor, new professor of medieval history, so I presume that he is another kindly historian like my wit. I should not look for too much amusement out of the evening then. Well, he has also undertaken the editorship of the North American Review. So, there is hope for some fun to be had out of his conversation after all. The ensemble swirls in around Clover, laughing, talking, and carrying champagne glasses. It is a party. Ellen catches Henry, who is observing the other partygoers with an appraising expression. She pulls him downstage toward Clover, who is watching the gathering from the side with a bemused look that is very similar to Henry's. Mr. Henry Adams, allow me to There we go. Thank you so much. Oh, to mount a production of it again. Well, <laughs> <laughs> this, I, I do have, uh, yes. I have the goal of getting it uh, to Boston someday. Ah. Post COVID, COVID life. <laughs> yes. And have, there been, have there been other productions of it since you premiered it here in 2017? Not full productions. Um, we were slated to do a reading of it at the New York Society Library in May. Um, that got postponed to October and has now been postponed to um, early or spring of 2021. Um, we've had um, uh, interest in the script from other theaters across the country um, as well who have asked us to if they can read it. So we'll keep shopping it around. <laughs> Well, congratulations. Natalie, after encountering Clover Adams, what's come next for you? Well, I am working on a biography of Isabella Stewart Gardner, who and her magnificent museum here in Boston. Um, they were, they knew each other. They were of the same social circle. They had kind of a little bit of a, <laughs> Um, I think Clover was intimidated by Gardner, which was not an uh, unusual experience. Um, but yes, so um, that is what I'm doing now. All right. Well, we have um, a couple questions. Someone wonders, how did the Adams finance their lives? 
He retired from Harvard at age 39 to become a full-time historian in DC. How did they afford to live in, you know, they first rented a house on Lafayette Park, not a small house. Then they build this beautiful home. How did they finance that? You want me to? Why don't you take that one? Um, so she was a Boston Brahmin and um, her, both her, her mother was a Sturgis and um, the Sturgis's, um, her, um, her grandfather was an important Boston merchant. So she inherited, she inherited her own money. And then Adams was Adams. The Adams family wasn't enormously wealthy, but they were certainly, um, they were wealthy. They weren't Gilded Age wealthy. The, the, the real wealth came from the Hoopers and the Sturgises. So Clover's uh, maiden name was Hooper. So that's how, yeah. Inherited uh, money, inherited money. Someone is, is I'm glad this person is, is mentioning this former Washington Post journalist, uh, because this journalist is, was kind of my point of entry, at least into Clover biography. Her name was Sarah Booth Conroy. Yes. And she had a regular column in the Washington Post for many, many years. She also wrote a fictionalized account called The Five of Hearts about the nope. Hayes and the Adams and the King, Clarence King, is he in there too? Yes. And he postulates. It's, can I just say one thing that's, that, that's Patricia O'Toole's book is Five of Hearts. I think you're thinking of refinements of love. Oh, yes. That's right. right. Yeah. Okay. In one of those books, and I remember this now. The fiction, yeah. Refinements. They, they postulate that there might have been an attraction or a relationship between um, John Hay and Henry Adams. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, you know, I've, there have been other speculations about Henry's um, sexuality. Um, it, you know, he was, he was flirt very flirtatious with women in a kind of gallant way. There just doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence for it. Um, it's not really in his letters that you can see it. Um, but that this oh, the, that is a part of people's lives that's very hard to know unless you have it in specifically in letters. Yeah. Like we do know Eleanor Roosevelt had yeah. a relationship with Lorena Hicks. That's very clear from the letters. So that's about what I would say about that. <laughs> but he did have um, really abiding deep relationships with yes. men. I mean, when he, he would does. travel extensively after her death, he- Lafarge, would, yeah, John Lafarge, yeah, John Lafarge and right. William Sturgis Bigelow. And uh, yeah, he really, and I mean, he had a gift for friendship. He really did. That was very, very clear. He kept his friends way from early in life all the way through the end. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always said it was a good day when you got a Henry Adams letter. They were just extraordinarily, Be some of them quite beautiful. Um, and he just wrote all the time and he kept up with people. I think, I think that he, he really shone in his friendships more than in his marriage. And, and he had a very complicated family. The Adamses were very complicated, um, remote and, you know, icy, icy sometimes. Um, Hi, and Laura, when you were writing your dramatization, um, how some of these qualities or characteristics of Henry, how did you sort of finesse those or bring them to life in your script? Well, one thing I found particularly remarkable about Henry is his two novels um, that people rarely read anymore. But I thought, I mean, they're both fascinating just as windows into life during that time and also into the way that he viewed his marriage and his friendships. Um, there are lots of qualities you can see in the heroines, both of democracy and of Esther, that resonate very strongly with Clover. Mm -hmm. um, and I spent a lot of time with both of those novels and sort of looking at Henry in a deeper way. Um, and I've also been fascinated by his grandmother, Louisa Catherine Adams, who Henry talks about frequently in the autobiography about how close he was to her um, and how valuable that relationship was to him. And I think she was someone in the family who was supportive, 
But his father, I mean, Charles Francis writes all the time about the pressure he feels from the family to uphold the Adam's name. And I think that's something that comes through with Henry as well. He is terrified of letting down the family. It's not easy to be related to John Adams and John Quincy Adams. Um, P.S. Eliot has a wonderful line about that. He said, Henry Adams never walked into a room anonymous. <laughs> he always knew that everyone knew who he was, always. And that, that, that makes a complex life. It's complicated. We did include a, a scene of um, Henry's parents meeting Clover and him sort of dealing with that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. introduction in the play. And you know, when you just hearing you all talk, you sort of can understand his choice to leave out the 20 years where he was in his most intimate relationship. Maybe that was something he just thought, she and I can keep that for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, was, it was also important to us that, you know, we, Laura and I both believe that they really, they loved each other. Um, you know, despite the Lizzie Cameron of it all, they really did love each other. Yeah. And he was beside himself when she yeah. died. Yeah. It's very sad. I mean, Esther's almost hard to read because there is a palpable fear that Esther will commit suicide. I mean, it's a novel about a woman who yeah. wants to make a name for herself as an artist. And at the end, she's at Niagara Falls, and there's a moment where you feel like she is seriously considering throwing herself in, and Henry can't quite write it. Right, uh, and Clarence King, when he read it, said the novel doesn't quite work because that character would have killed herself. And this is before Clover had died, mm -hmm. right? So it's like he was anticipating, he was sensing this, earthquake within their, you know, or the trembling within their, within her. Yeah. Why Natalie, she takes these really impressive, impressive, artful photographs. Yes. But she didn't become a photographer. I mean, she didn't become a professional photographer. What's that about? You know, there's, you know, he was the famous person and there was room for that. And she was in a particular role. And there was one of her photographs of George Bancroft, really one of her greatest photographs, I think. Um, in fact, Gardner has a copy in the Gardner Museum. So she had oh, given wow. Isabella a copy of that photograph. Um, um, the publisher of Century Magazine wanted to put it on its cover and have Henry write a profile of George Bancroft. And the same day, they both reply to that editor saying, um, we're not gonna have photographs on the cover of Century. We're not gonna put, right? So she declines and he declines at the same time. Um, you can almost visualize the conversation that they have, right? <laughs> um, and I think that was just enough discouragement. There's a line in Esther about iron bars, being, being caught behind iron bars. And I always felt like that was, that must have, and that, that um, um, saying no to that opportunity happened just as he was writing Esther, actually. So, you know, the, um, it, you just have a sense that she just couldn't go any further. And there just wasn't, you wouldn't have seen a lot of women. I, first, I really wanted her to be like a feminist figure, right? And, Right, because so much is happening in Washington at that time for women. Yeah, yeah. Stanton, yeah. There's all these. It's a mile from their house, and I was just like, "Go, go, listen to Elizabeth Cady Stanton." Um, but she would have, she would not have affiliated herself in that way because she would have lost too much social standing in the being a in a Brahmin family like that. So um, that was very complicated. Yeah. Someone is asking, and I, I, I wish I had included a slide that shows the home that the Adamses and the Hayes built on Lafayette Park. I neglected to do that, but someone was asking about um, that site, how that site has fared during the past days when there has been a certain amount of property destruction at that intersection right by the White House. Well, the Hay Adams house was erected um, in 1885, she wasn't 1885. able to live in it, but just as she died, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it, it 
it kind of wrapped around the corner of 16th and H Street. It was a beautiful, I like to think of it as one of the best works of residential architecture of a Boston-based architect, Henry Hobson Richardson. Um, he even kind of gave birth to a style of architecture in name for him, Richardsonian Romanesque, a beautiful rusticated stone on the first level and then smoother um, stone, redstone in this case for the upper stories, recessed entryway, beautiful rounded arched windows. So there was this companion house, the Adams's residence opened up onto H Street, the Hayes opened up onto 16th Street. So they would have been walking right out toward St. John's Church. And it stood there till 1926, 1925, 26, when it is purchased by a um, prolific DC residential developer called Henry Wardman. And he makes a decision to knock it down and erect on the site a hotel, a, a beautiful a luxury hotel that now is called the Hay Adams Hotel. So um, the Hay Adams Hotel is now, since the 1920s when it arrived, has itself become a landmark and kind of an iconic structure. But it's hard for me to talk about that site when I'm giving a walking tour of Lafayette Park and not describe the destruction of the Hay Adams House as an architectural crime. Um, but there we have it. The Hay Adams Hotel, as far as I can say, see, did not sustain damage. Um, they boarded up their lower story windows with plywood and that may have helped. I don't know if they got any, um, I'm not even sure they, they got any um, graffiti on them, but um, it's still there. I don't know. Um, Laura and I, uh, we had many, many uh, writing meetings in Off the Record, which is the restaurant on the basement of that hotel. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, what is the Hay Adams Memorial in Rock Creek Park? It's often called Grief. Um, it had, Laura, you know the full name of it, um, Henry's name. <laughs> Part of it's the peace that passes all understanding, right? I think, you correct me if I'm wrong, Natalie, but I think it is the peace of God which passeth understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I mean, people um, would write him, right? They would write him and say, what is the title and what does this mean? And he would write and say, it, it means what you think it means, yes. right? He did not want to um, contain it with his interpretation because he wanted it to live on, right? So that everyone gets to have an experience of it. So you're not controlled by his interpretation of it which is very modern. It's very it's modern. Very modern. Very modern. It was very modern. Well, actually, at the time it was being designed and it was being conceived, it was very, he was kind of on the cutting edge of how much influence he wanted Asian philosophy, Asian yes. imagery to inform it. Yes. And that was all kind of coming into being at that time. So In 1986, he travels with John Lafarge to Japan as a kind of, I have to get out of here, you know, out of Washington. And he stays, I can't remember, I think it's almost a year, nine months at least. And it's it's sort of seeing Japan and seeing Buddhist statues and Kwanin, which was a figure right. in um, Japanese religion, right. um, that he starts to get in, an idea of what he wants. Mm -hmm. um, one, another Washington Walks guide, Martin Murray, he is um, listening in. And Martin, thank you for contributing this. When the Hay Adams house was knocked down, taken down, taken apart, some elements of it were incorporated into two other homes <clears throat> in Washington, DC. And Washington Walks Guide Martin lives near the neighborhood, which is kind of known as Woodland Norman Stone. And there you can walk through that neighborhood and you can see the door to Henry Adams house and you can also see the entrance arches to the Hayes house incorporated into two separate homes in that neighborhood. If we can ever get out and do public walking tours again, Martin will do a tour that includes those two things. Um, 
I think the other house that incorporated architectural elements, maybe there was a house in Georgetown. Correct me if I'm wrong, anyone out there listening. Ty, Laura, and Natalie, what's the, what's something that you wish everyone here listening will take away with them about Clover Adams? Speak freely. She just has such a presence. Um, she, you know, ever since I got to know her, she kind of pops in and out of my life in very weird and unexpected ways. Um, but I just kind of always sense something about her spirit around in different times of my life. Um, and her, her story is, you can find so many connections to what's going on in our world now. Mm -hmm especially as, as women and artists and people making art. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. <laughs> and I think for me, one thing that, that always stands out, reading her letters and reading what people say about her, is her boundless capacity for hope, for love and compassion. Mm -hmm. um, everything she does, she throws her whole heart into it. Yeah. Um, when she was in Boston and thought she was going to be a spinster, she threw her whole heart into helping others and to supporting them. When she marries Henry, she throws her whole heart into mm -hmm. supporting his career. They move to Washington. She dies into the political scene. She becomes a photographer and she works to find these beautiful images of the world and of her friends. And I think that's something that's incredibly inspiring and is shown through in that quote that's at the beginning of, of the book um, yeah. that now published. I yes. think it's a beautiful summary of her sort of outlook. I think her story is such a mix of shadow and light, yeah. right? And I think, you know, I felt like she had, she was known to history as the wife of Henry Adams, so who she married, and that she killed herself. And so she'd been judged, basically, on the very worst day of her life, <laughs> and, and always seen through that lens, right? And so I think it's, I guess it, what is it, that um, people's lives are always complex, right? And they, they, they're always of this mixture of dark shadows and light. Mm -hmm. um, even a story like hers, which ends so sadly. Um, so. But generated at least three wonderful works of art. Uh, Your novel, the play, the memorial, I mean, the memorial, um, I think yeah. is functioning exactly how Henry Adams wanted it to. Yes, a place for people to gather and grieve and mm -hmm. understand their life. Mm -hmm. Yep, mm -hmm. made, yeah. yep, yep. People, when people go to Rock Creek Cemetery, and I hope they will, yeah. um, and sit by that memorial, you will understand what Nellie just said, yeah. yeah. Ty, Laura, Natalie, and Victoria, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Wonderful yeah. hour with Clover Adams. It was wonderful to have you. Thanks everyone who joined in. Yes. Usually at this point, I announce what we're going to have next week. It hasn't been confirmed entirely yet. It's possible, though, that it's going to be about poetry inspired by the Adams Memorial. We'll send out an email as soon as have that confirmed or not, but whatever we're doing next Wednesday, but we'll be back next Wednesday. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Bye -bye. everyone. Bye.